All right, so uh, before we get started, uh, how many people have experience with Haskell? Okay. And uh, like, supposing you had Haskell on the JVM, what benefits do you think you can get? I just want to hear a round of opinions. Anybody? Yeah, exactly. So like, right. So like, uh, like an issue with uh, with uh, putting a Haskell project in an existing project is that uh, it compiles to native. So in order to make it meld well with the rest of your system, you'll have to use like Apache Drift or so many other uh, inter-process communication kind of methods in order to communicate with it, which you lose some efficiency in that uh, communication. So what uh, I want. Uh, what I wanted to do is like remove that communication, uh, uh, what, what's it called, latency. So instead, instead of uh, communicating through some inter-process communication, you just write the, rewrite the entire Haskell runtime on the JVM. So, so what will it? So now, once we have Haskell on the JVM, what new possibilities does that give us? One. So one of the biggest problems in Haskell is the fact that there's no cross-platform GUI, like the GUI library. And the, the reason for that is like, it's very hard like, uh, to write native GUI apps. Like you'll have, some, uh, you'll have something for Linux, you'll have something for Windows, but you don't have one uniform thing to communicate across all of them. But Java gives us a cross-platform solution. Like JavaFX is also Swing and all those. But I, I, since JavaFX is the most recent one, I've been using that. So another thing you can do is uh, build func uh, FRP library on top of that. How many, how many of you have heard of FRP? So yeah, so it'll give us a nice cross-platform FRP framework. Like it'll solve that problem we've been having in Haskell for a long time. And yeah, you can also build games if you have the thing about. And another cool thing is being able to pro uh, like program Spark jobs, Hadoop jobs inside of this. Like normally, you'll be confined to Java, and obviously, Java is uh, error prone. Has so many side effects, as we talked about this morning. So, uh, so like this will. Uh, so GSGVM is like this embeddable, lazy functional language you can use on demand on the JVM. So, uh, re just like a couple weeks back, I implemented a feature to be able to export a Haskell function to Java. So, like, uh, let's say you have a Haskell function that takes an integer and returns. Uh, Say it returns another integer. Say it's something like a factorial function, just for example. So what uh, what that feature allows you to do is be able to export that and be able to call that as a normal Java function. So what uh, what that generated function does is uh, it initializes the runtime system of GHCVM, and then it allows you uh, it does all the uh, conversions necessary to convert from Java types to Haskell types, and then uh, it uh, then it converts back from Haskell type to a Java type. So uh, okay. So another cool thing we get access to in the JVM uh, that I don't think people have tried that much is hot code reloading. So people familiar with Clojure would probably uh, in, be familiar with that. So uh, it's still like uh, something that's not well researched, but it's something you can try now because the JVM has like this inbuilt. Uh, Dynamism, because you can load classes at a runtime rate and create classes at runtime. So, uh, hot code reloading would be so much like uh, several times easier to implement on the JVM as opposed to, say, on native like GHC. And yeah, the, the biggest point you get access to like the entire Java ecosystem using this within Haskell. So, I think, yeah, so what's GHCVM? It's just, uh, it's a ha Haskell to JVM compiler that supports GHC Haskell, specifically 7.10.3. So that's like almost like that's uh, second oldest version. Right now we're at GHC 8. The version just before that is GHC 7.10.3. So this supports like all those modern features like uh, what type family, all those things. So we already attracted some contributors. So uh, Brian McKenna, the guy who gave the talk this morning, uh, so he's contributed some very nice bug fixes and. Uh, Alok Koshard, uh, he gave a talk on machines this morning. He's all, he also, uh, he provided the foundation for the library I use in Haskell to uh, generate the bytecodes. And then Sibi, he's right here. 
Uh, so he's been helping out maintaining the infrastructure and everything. And Christopher Wells, he's, he's not here. <laughs> okay, so the main goals of this project are uh, to main, uh, maintain compatibility with GHC Haskell. So the reason why I say GHC Haskell is that uh, there's a comp competing implementation to what I'm talking about. There's a thing called Friga. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. So uh, that is like a subset of Haskell that compiles to the JVM. So that's why I emphasize GHC here, to emphasize that it's the Haskell that GHC compiles. So that's a major goal. And the reason why uh, that's a major goal is that not only do we get access to the Java ecosystem, we get access to Hackage, the Haskell ecosystem as well. So this gives us, so this project allows us to use two ecosystems simultaneously, which is pretty cool. So another thing, uh, as far as I've explored Frika just a little bit, but I noticed that the foreign function interface, the way you interact with Java methods inside of Haskell is a bit complicated. So I have introduced some new uh, ways to make it easier. And then uh, another goal, uh, for those of you who know about GHC, GHC is like a what, almost 25, 24, 25 year old research project that's actually gotten into industry, which is pretty cool. It's in the unique position of doing that. So, uh, but another problem there is like, they emphasize uh, implementing more advanced type system features uh, more than like trying to optimize what they already have and uh, make it faster. So uh, there's also a gap there. So I wanted to fill that gap as well. I wanted to make this completely industry oriented, meaning uh, I felt that was fine. Whatever GHC 10.3 had to offer to the table is pretty good. Like you can write really cool programs with that. So uh, I want to take that as a base and then extend it from there. So uh, I'll discuss what my future plans are in that aspect uh, at the end of the talk. So now this is a comparison. So uh, GHC VM is compatible with Hackage. Um, I'll give a link at the end of the talk where I sh show like, all the packages that are compatible right now. So uh, Free, uh, Friga is not, com it is somewhat compatible with Hackage. I won't say it's completely not. But there's a lot of, because it doesn't have all the features of GHC that are used in the libraries in Hackage, you can't actually just compile out of the box. But you can with GHC VM. So you can also interact with Java libraries. Uh, in GHC, you technically can interact with Java libraries through JNI and stuff. Uh, one company has done that with uh, interacting with Spark using JNI, but uh, it's not, uh, it's very difficult to do. You can't do it, you can't just easily merge in any Java library you want. You have to be like an expert, almost. So uh, all of them have like a basic level type system that, uh, basic level type system like uh, parametric polymorphism, type classes, those basic features that were there for a long time. And then uh, it also has access, as I said, because it's, supports 7.10.3, it has access to all the advanced features that have been coming out in the past couple of years. And uh, as of now, uh, we don't have support for Temple Haskell because that requires the implementation of the interpreter. So the equivalent of GATI for GATVM, that's not done yet, that's a to-do item. So uh, another major difference is the way concurrency is handled. I'll mention that in some time. So how did it start? So I started playing around with Haskell about four years back, and uh, I was just I was just trying to solve like simple mathematical uh, problems on uh, Project Euler. So uh, I was I initially started on Python, and then uh, it didn't work. Uh, the solution didn't come out for some reason. It took forever to run, and then I just reimplemented Haskell at the time. It took that for me to learn, and suddenly it worked. So like that was when I got the oh wow this is magic moment. So how many, how many of you actually think Haskell's magic? <laughs> so, and you'll get to see how, I'll, today I'll like uh, discuss the execution of a simple program so you get, you get to see how, how much work is actually going on to get that magic to work. So, uh, and then I, I took some uh, deviation to uh, do lots of Android programming. So that's when I got access to the Java ecosystem. So uh, I understood like what are all the problems in the Java ecosystem. So then I also was, uh, just a hobbyist Haskell, I would read all these articles. The thing is, Haskell has so many features and like, it's almost overwhelming. You feel like you have to learn everything, but then later as I moved on, I learned you actually don't need to learn all those advanced features. You're fine with just a basic core. And so about one year ago, like I got reached my saturation point in Java. I'm like, I really just wanna work in Haskell. I've also worked in lots of startups. So in those startups, I've, I was developing the backends and uh, working with Android apps. 
So I had to use Java, I had no option back then. But uh, yeah, so I was starting to get the idea of, okay, I really wanna use Haskell for mobile and like all these other things. That's where I got the idea, okay, I need to somehow get Haskell on a JVM. So, that, uh, so that's one thing. But back then, uh, what I wanted to do was I wanted to create a DSL that cross compiles to like iOS, Android, and uh, Windows. I don't know, I don't, I don't even know if that's worth it, but yeah. So that was the goal back then. I just wanted to create a DSL. I didn't want to directly compile to Java, but yeah, this turned out. And then uh, another major thing that influenced uh, GHCVM was my time with Clojure. So I spent almost six months working in Clojure. So it was a, it's a great language, and uh, what I loved about Clojure was like the ease of being able to import Java functions and everything. But the only thing I missed from Clojure was the type system. Everything else was amazing in Clojure. So, uh, so then once I reached my saturation point with Clojure as well, so uh, I was like, okay, maybe I should start uh, getting down with this uh, Haskell JVM compiler. And uh, so what I did was I started reading lots of research papers. So compiling Haskell to JVM is not a new idea. It's been researched and uh, people have written papers on it like back in the 1990s and 2000s. So uh, they wrote papers, but they weren't completely conclusive. Like uh, they all determined, okay, like uh, it's inefficient to do this. It's not worthwhile to do something like this. So, and I agree, like maybe back in those times, back then Java was still like very uh, primitive. I don't think they even had a proper JIT compiler back then. So like it would've been extremely inefficient to implement Haskell back then. So, but now uh, Java has come a long way since then. It's been like, what, a decade and a half since those papers were written and lots of developments have been made. Now Java's used everywhere. So now I felt, okay, maybe this is the right time to work on something like this. So uh, one of the, uh, another major motivation for this was uh, I wanted to use Haskell in my startups. And uh, one of the things I didn't want happening was uh, I didn't want to like suddenly have a bug in production, like a compiler bug, and then having to wait on the GHC people to get it done. So if you, if you guys know, I think I mentioned just now, GHC is a volunteer project. So there's no people completely committed full time to maintaining it. So that's actually a bit of insecurity for me. And I'm not just for me, I'm pretty sure for a lot of other people who actually want to use it in production. So I wasn't, I didn't like that as well. So I felt the best solution <laughs> if I wanted to actually use Haskell was to learn GHC completely. So if any problem ever came up, I'd be able to deal with it. I'm sure not everybody comes to that solution, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So um, I think I talked about this lack of libraries. So like just uh, Hackage is developing pretty well. There's lots of libraries, but the libraries we need for day-to-day -day use, there's uh, still a lot of work there. Um, and documentation is a huge problem as well. Like you'll just, a lot of people, because they say types are descriptive, they won't even bother documenting. Uh, types are descriptive, but they don't subsume documentation. So, and nothing was Cabal. So uh, actually, I, one of the reasons why it took me so long to actually even write one line of Haskell code was because of Cabal. Like, I was just, tr trying to, uh, just trying to compile a sample of programs, and what ended up happening was I would get that uh, de dependency failure, dependency resolution failure, and then I'd be like, why do I need to waste my time with this? I have so many other things going on, so. And after Stack came out, that's when I started becoming more active in Haskell. So now I'll, I'll, I'll talk about how uh, GHCVM was architected and how the components work together. So, um, so GHCVM consists of many components, uh, like this top half. The top half is uh, all from GHC. So I haven't done that, that's been already done. And uh, so it starts with the driver. The driver is the one that manages the compilation of different components. Like I had to modify that to also uh, compile Java files. So as of now, you can actually compile Java files and Haskell files, both with GHCVM. So, and then uh, once the driver determines what the component to compile is, it'll send it to the next part of the pipeline, which is parser type checker optimizer. So that part I won't discuss because I haven't done much work on that. That's already been done by very smart people. And it works very well, actually. That's why Haskell is pretty fast these days. And then, so the output of that entire process is a thing called SDG code. Uh, I'll explain that uh, in a couple slides. For now, we'll just leave it. It's just the output of GHC. And uh, so the code generator, this is completely what I had to do from, uh, from scratch using the GHC code generator as an inspiration. So, uh, so what the code generator does is it converts this STG code, this low-level intermediate representation of Haskell, to a class file. 
actually not just one, they'll convert to many because of how the implementation is. And then we'll wrap them all up into a jar. So almost every, ha every Haskell module you write in a project will compile it to a jar file. And then uh, it also takes care of, at the end when you want just, w just one single Uber jar, it'll uh, link all of them together into one giant self-contained jar that contains the runtime system as well, the RTS. So I also wanted to take, take a minute to explain how Cabal VM works. Cabal VM is the fork of Cabal that, that's patched to work with GHC VM. So uh, one of the things I had to do in order to maintain compatibility with Hackage is uh, I had to patch some libraries because a lot, a lot of the core libraries in Haskell, they use C functions. So in order to make those work on the JVM, uh, one option is to compile everything in JNI, which is probably not a, it's not a portable solution. So instead, I just rewrote all those CFFI calls into Java. So uh, now I need to somehow tell Cabal that these changes are there because obviously I can't uh, submit an upstream patch because this isn't unrelated to normal GHC. It's specific to this. So rather than interfering with the normal GHC process, I decided to make my own uh, uh, repository that contains a set of packages. Uh, not packages, patches. So these patches will, will be pretty small. Maybe like the diffs will be like what? 20 lines, 200 lines, depending on how, uh, how many uh, C FFI calls that are being used. So, uh, so now what Cabal VM does is it consults this repository. And if you're trying to install a package which has a patch in this repository, it'll automatically patch it, and then it'll build the patched one. So using this method, I was able to actually get access to a good chunk of package. As of now, we've compiled a good number, maybe like what, close to 20, 30 packages. So it's pretty nice. So yeah, so GSC VM Hackage is like this layer between Hackage and Cabal VM that it acts as, a, as like a filter. Okay, so I'm going to, uh, so now I'll discuss the uh, runtime system and I'll explain it by showing a very trivial uh, Haskell program and showing how it uh, works. So before we get into that, uh, I wanna take some time to explain lazy evaluation. How many people are comfortable completely with lazy evaluation. You understand all the quirks and everything. <laughs> okay, good, so this will be useful to a lot of people then. Okay, so this is a very trivial way to distinguish between uh, lazy evaluation and strict evaluation. So uh, according to Wikipedia, it's an evaluation strategy which delays the evaluation of an expression until its value is needed and which also avoids repeated evaluations. So that second part which says which also avoids repeated evaluations is probably the trickiest part of, the, one of the trickiest parts of implementing uh, laziness on the JVM in, in, in general, actually. So, uh, so here are the two code samples. One is in Haskell, one is in Java. So I tried to make them as similar as possible. Uh, in Java, there's no generic like exception thing, so I had to improvise. So what, what's happening is you have a list of two elements and undefined, for those of you who don't know, it's a value which upon a value, uh, if you evaluate it, will crash your program. It's, it's, almost, it's almost like you can think of it as a result of a function that throws an exception or something. So uh, the, some, somewhat similar in Java is, uh, so I just <laughs> initialized a null string and I'm calling, okay, it's not get length, it's actually length, my bad. So basically I'm trying to get the length of the string, which is null. So uh, in Java, this would actually crash with an exception right away with a null pointer exception if you executed this. Why? Because Java evaluates every, every expression. So this val.getLength, or val.length, will get a value right away, and because val is null, you'll get a null pointer exception, done. So it doesn't go any further. But if you look at this example, this example will actually run in Haskell, because Haskell is lazy. So, and what does lazy mean? Lazy means that the evaluation is delayed. So, this, uh, this two and this undefined are not evaluated until they're needed for, for some purpose. So head, what does head do? It evaluates the list and gives you the first element. But we don't, uh, let's assume this is the only program. Let's say the only program was printing the head. So you never care about the second element, right? So why should your program crash if you never actually use the second element, right? So that's what, uh, that's what, uh, that's a capability you get from lazy evaluation. And because of the lazy evaluation, you can do lots of lots of neat tricks. So now I mentioned STG code before. STG stands for spineless tagless G machine. This is, uh, this is an abstract uh, reduction machine that was written in a research paper by Simon Payton Jones a while ago. So this is actually, this mechanism is the reason why uh, 
Haskell is as efficient as it is today. So, um, so this sounds fancy, like SVG code, but it's actually just a reduced form of Haskell where all you have are just cases and lets to make it very simple. So, uh, so in SVG, when you look at the code, uh, to give you, so one thing uh, it's very tricky to do in Haskell is try to actually execute in your head. Like if you write a C program, you can just go through it line by line and be like, okay, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening. When you go to a, when you go to a Haskell program line by line, you can't do the exact same thing. So I want to help you guys visualize it a bit better. This isn't perfect, but it's a bit better. And then a normal form, it just means okay, everything is simple. You, you can't uh, you won't, you can't have complicated expressions. Everything uh, is bound to some variable. So a, a, another part of the SDG code is function applications, primitive operations, and literals. So primitive operations, these are the things that you can't implement in Haskell that have to be implemented at the runtime system level. So an example would be integer addition. The runtime has no idea how to add integers, actually. It just knows how to. Uh, the, runtime, the only thing the runtime knows how to do is delay uh, evaluations. All it knows how to do is uh, delay them, unbox things, box things, that's it. But it doesn't know how to do the uh, goal of operations. So you, you have to use primitive operations to do that. So I'll, so I'll introduce a very simple example. So the final program on compile is take two of map times two of, uh, one, of list going from one to five. So this looks deceptively simple. Well, uh, the answer to this is it should return a list of two, two comma four. But uh, what exactly goes on in getting this to evaluate is the interesting question. So first, let's take a look at the definitions of map. So uh, these definitions are a bit flawed. So first, let's take a look at map. So everybody's familiar with map, right? It's like the bread and butter functional programming. So uh, it's a function. Uh, it's a function that takes another function that'll transform a list from uh, of one type of elements to a list of another type of elements. So the standard way of uh, any anybody any beginner would define it, it would be uh, okay. So if you, you do a case a case by case about, about, uh, analysis. So a list can only have two possibilities. It can either be empty, or it can, uh, it can be broken down into two parts. So if it's empty, then obviously, if you have an empty list, there's nothing transformed, so you just an empty list. If, uh, if the list has some elements, then you uh, destructure it, and then it should be F, okay. So uh, you destructure it, you apply the function on the first element, and then you recursively apply map on the rest of the list. So now that is like the normal Haskell implementation you would do. So now uh, this is actually what it would look like, all, uh, roughly it would look like this when you co uh, compile it to STG. So as I said, STG is just a simpler version of Haskell that just has cases and lets. So, so this is actually, uh, the, the example you see here is equivalent to this. So what it does, so case is you can think of as the primitive in the RTS that says evaluate this, uh, evaluate whatever is inside the case. So in this case, first you want to evaluate the list. You want to see whether it's empty or not. So if it's empty, return empty otherwise. So now you see a let. So what this does is when you see a let in STG code, you should think of that as allocation. So anytime you have a let, it's allocating a new thing called a thunk. So a thunk is a suspended, uh, it's like an expression that hasn't been evaluated yet and uh, eventually needs to be evaluated. So I could have shown you guys actual SDG code, which is, uh, there's an option in GHC you can send uh, ddump SDG. It'll give you the SDG code, but it's ridiculously hard to read because it has all sorts, it uses all sorts of randomly generated names. So I had to, I did a manual compilation for you guys so you could, it's easier to see what's going on. So what it does, so it'll create a thunk, and then uh, it'll construct a new list with the transformed element plus the thunk. Now let's look at take. So take is a t teeny bit more complicated because you have an extra thing where you have to uh, check the base case. So in the base case, when it's zero, you should return a, when there's nothing to take, 
you should return an empty list. And then in the false case, if, if it's not zero, if it's not zero, then you evaluate the list, break it up. If it's, uh, if it's empty, again, return empty. If it does have some elements, then uh, recursively call take with n minus one. And then uh, with the rest of the list. And then re, uh, construct the final thing. So here, you're doing two allocations. You're, a you're allocating a box for n to store the value of n minus one, and you're all allocating a box for x, x as double prime. So uh, now you can see like where the allocations are happening, uh, where the evaluations are happening. That's what SCG code does. It's like a, what's up? But there is one, there is an allocation actually. When you, uh, there's an implicit allocation when you reconstruct any data type. That's also allocated. My bad. Actually, uh, this is not correct. I should have added an extra let. Thank you for catching that. So this is actually, that was improper at STG. So uh, there we go. So this is actually how it's supposed to be. Thanks for catching that. So yeah, there's two allocations here. And then uh, you bind them together. So this, the, so there's two ways to allocate in STG. One is to use a let statement. Another way is to construct some Haskell data type. So yeah, similarly in case, you have two allocations and then an allocation at the end. You can think of it like that actually. So when I t speak of allocation, I mean uh, data, new data is being used. Like a new, yeah, some RAM is being blocked. Yeah, exactly what I mean. Huh, actually I'm going to explain that a little bit. The reason why I'm explaining all this at the very low level so you guys understand how to debug space leaks at some point. Because you understand where spa how to uh, indirectly see when there's a space leak. Actually, Neil Mitchell recently gave a good talk about detecting space leaks. So I'll give, like, I'm basically giving the background of that talk. Like, what all you need to know in order to understand. So this is the, the program. Okay. So now we've broken down map and take into the, their very low level, uh, their most low level form. So now, uh, bef before we get into the runtime part, let's, uh, Let's just take a look at how the evaluation will look like. So the specific example we have here is take two of map uh, times two, one to five. And for those who know Haskell, there's a lot of syntactic sugar here. Actually, one of the function, uh, that list, one dot dot five is actually not a list, it's a function. So uh, for now, we'll ignore all those extra details. We'll just make it simple. So now let's look at the definition of take. So what does it take do? First thing take does is it evaluates whether uh, the expression n is double equal to zero. So that's, uh, you can substitute this as uh, Brian mentioned this morning, referential transparency. This, this thing I'm doing right now, you can do in other languages. This thing you can do in Haskell though. So here uh, you're directly replacing take with, with, with this definition, which is you're comparing two, you're comparing two to zero. So obviously that's false. Again, uh, for double equals, there's a trick, trick there because it's a type class function. There's actually more going on, but I'm ignoring all that for now. So just assume it's just like, uh, it's a direct function that gives you the result. So uh, double equals to zero is false, right? So now let's look. If the evaluation returns false, go to this branch. So that's what the evaluation returns to. So now uh, you have something more complicated. So now excess in take, this excess in take, is now map in this case. Map. So now I have to evaluate that. So now I have to evaluate that, get the result, and then I have to remember uh, the result for later. So anytime you have to remember something, uh, you have to store it somewhere, right? So we're going to say, uh, we're going to store uh, what to do, the continuation. So what to do after we get the result of this map expression, what do we want to, uh, the function that says what to do, the continu continuation, will be stored as a frame, stack frame. I'll explain that in just a bit. Uh, so that's what this plus zero means. Plus means I just create a new stack frame uh, of a zero index. And then the next part is, now, you, uh, now let's say you got the result of map. So the result of map will look something like this. Uh, it'll be times two of one, colon, map f, two, uh, two dot dot five. So what that means is it's uh, taken, it's stripped off the first element, it's applied the function, it hasn't applied the function to it, if you noticed. 
the times two is still there. This is the thing with the lazy evaluation. Absolutely nothing will get evaluated till the very last moment. And that uh, one fact is why you get space leaks. There are times where you want this times two, uh, one times two to get evaluated right away before carrying it through all the way down. So, uh, so as you, as you observe that that's there, and then uh, map F, two, uh, two, two to five. So uh, if you look here, so that gives you a valuation of map. So now you look at, uh, so now it can be de deconstructed. If you look, it has a colon, right? That means it has two parts. It has a head and a tail. So now we deconstruct it. So this x is now times two uh, applied to one. And this xs prime is map f, map of the rest of the list. So now what happens? We, al we do two allocations. We allocate a slot for n, which is the n you pass into uh, take again. And then the slot for the recursive called to take. So now this returns uh, a list, a newly constructed list. And eventually, if you continue this process, eventually you'll get two to four. And another thing is, this expression by itself does nothing because nothing is forcing it to evaluate. You guys have to assume that there's, you're printing it. So when you print something, you need to evaluate everything so you can you know what to print. So that'll force the evaluation of everything. So now that's like a basic idea of how the lazy evaluation works. And uh, now we'll get into uh, nitty gritty details. So now I'll take some time to explain how the GCVM runtime system works. So what it does is uh, it'll generate a main, main method for you, a uh, classic Java main method. And then what it'll do is it'll do an initialization of the runtime system. And then uh, it'll, it'll go into Haskell world. So you see this border, this is intentional. It's to show that there's two worlds here. There's Java and there's Haskell. So uh, right from the bat, right off the bat, you'll initialize our, our runtime system. And then it'll, it'll get sent to Haskell world. So by the way, uh, everything I'll be explaining to you about how the runtime system works is exactly how it works in GHC. So you can actually, uh, whatever, learn you, whatever you learn here, you can you apply to uh, any development you guys do in GHC. So, so how do, like, what are the different components of the runtime system? So uh, if you see here, you see core. So what core refers to is the processor of the computer, of the un underlying computer. So uh, you can have a computer with multiple cores, right? So uh, on top of each core, you'll have an abstraction called a task. So a task is just some data structure in the runtime system that has a one-to-one -one correspondence with some physical processor. So it's a way of abstracting over the processor in the runtime system level. And then you have a thing called a capability. So what a capability is, is something, it's, it's again another data structure that keeps track of all the Haskell expressions you, that need to be evaluated and all the threads. So uh, for those of you who are familiar, Haskell threads are green which means that they're very lightweight and create like millions of them, just similar to er er Erlang uh, processes. So uh, in order for that to work, you need a capability to manage these threads. So the, whole, the goal of a capability is to keep all this information, like uh, what are all the threads that I have to run, and what, what code do these threads have to run, and when should I context switch these threads, when should one thread uh, stop executing, go to another thread. So a capability will run one thread at a time, one green thread at a time. So now uh, capabilities and tasks are also in one-to-one. -one. So uh, you can have, so let's say you have n cores, you'll have n capabilities as well. Actually you can have less depending on how you configure the RTS. So uh, yeah, so the next thing uh, below, so as I said, capabilities uh, organize what are called thread state objects or TSOs. So um, those are the threads as I mentioned. And then inside those threads, you'll have the stack of the thread. So this stack, as I mentioned before, you need it for doing lazy evaluation. So this stack will tell you, okay, uh, this stack will tell you what to do next. So anytime you're doing an uh, evaluation, let's say you've finished evaluating, like you've gotten to uh, the po point at which you construct that list. It's in weak head normal form, that's what it's called. When it gets to that point, you want to, return, you want to know what to do after that, right? So the stack frame is like the memory that remembers what to do after you've finished evaluating whatever you had to evaluate. So there are actually many other frames. There's frames for exceptions to, to be able to know, uh, to catch exceptions and stuff. There's so many other stuff, but I won't get into any of that. We'll only be discussing one type of frame today, which is the update frame. This is the frame that takes care of this one part of lazy evaluation, which, uh, where it says, which also avoids repeated evaluations. So how do we do that? We need to remember the result, right? 
So we need to override the thunk, as I mentioned before, with the value that it evaluated to. So that way, if the thunk is used in multiple locations, you just use the evaluated value rather than evaluating it, evaluating it again, which goes against lazy evaluation. So here's the basic hierarchy. So uh, when you have a Haskell function, it compiles down to a subclass of STG closure. So STG closure is like the superclass of any object used inside of the GCVM runtime. So these are the four main subclasses. These are like the categories of Haskell objects in the runtime. STG fun is a function, Haskell function. STG path is a partially applied, uh, partially, no, it's a second piece. Okay, so it's basically a partially applied function. And then uh, STG thunk, thunk as I mentioned is a, a suspended uh, expression that hasn't been evaluated yet. So the thunk will contain code that builds the expression when it's entered, and then it'll also contain code to override itself when it's done. So once the thunk override, overwrites itself, it'll be one of these, STG fun, STG path, or STG constructor. So STG constructor, or uh, the abbreviation I put here, this is the superclass of all Haskell user-defined data types. So when you have lists, when you have bools, everything, uh, the superclass of those types is SGG con uh, constructor. So SGG thunk will evaluate to one of these three eventually. So uh, now I'll be showing what time is it? Five more minutes. Okay, cool. So I'll quickly show the. Uh, Okay, if it's five minutes, I probably won't have time to show this. Uh, in that case, I'll just go to uh, where, so did, did you guys at least get something from how lazy evaluation works? Like, is there any questions you have about that? Thunk would evaluate to one of those three. So Thunk is a suspended expression that has to value to something, right? Because Haskell. Function is made out of thunks, right? Yeah, it can. Yeah, you can Function can return a function. So this thunk will evaluate to a function. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in that case, your outer function is a thunk. When it will evaluate it, you will get a, a STG file. STG thunk will evaluate to STG So if you're writing a head or a map, previous. Yeah. Would that be an STG thunk or would that be an STG fun? So uh, let's go back to the expressions. So I'll classify these now. So map itself is an STG fun. But uh, you see this expression here, take to map of this. This, is a, this entire thing is a thunk. This entire thing is a thunk. This sub expression map, this uh, map times two, that's also a thunk. So a thunk can be composed of other thunks. A function doesn't evaluate more thunks, it creates thunks. So when you, when you execute that function, it creates more thunks uh, that eventually have to be evaluated. Good? Okay. So unfortunately, I'm out of time, so I'm gonna skip to the end. Um, I will, the other stuff I had prepared was like a, where I hand compiled uh, th these two functions to uh, what it looks like in GHCVM. So unfortunately, I don't have time for that. I'll just upload it, and you can find it on my GitHub probably. So now I just want to spend the last few minutes talking about like where this is going. So uh, first step, I want to introduce Type Lead, which is a startup I'm working on. I want to commercialize the work that's going on here. I want to provide commercial support for GHCVM. But uh, another announcement I want to make is that uh, I'm actually I actually want to create a new language entirely, like uh, which is branched off of GHC 10.10.3 which is focused on adding all those features necessary to get this into industry. So one thing I had a discussion with uh, some startup where they discussed a problem with records, Haskell records. So things like that. So any, any major problems that are actually acting as a barrier for it to be adopted, those things we'll be working on. So one of the, the solutions to that record problem is root type polymorphism. I think Brian, you, you know, you've implemented this, haven't you, and Roy. So, uh, so that, and we also have a focus on enterprise libraries. So like, as, as I mentioned before, like Hackage is great, it has lots of libraries, but there's still a lot of gaps, like in terms of like proper database access libraries for like all the different databases and all that. 
So we also, in, in this company, we also want to create really nice courses to teach this language to people. So you, you guys can think of this as like the, uh, what do you say, the implementation of Haskell that's completely focused on trying to get into the industry. So I also would really love some contributors. So uh, right now, uh, you know what, I'll show a quick demo. So this is a F5 example that, this is how F5 looks. F5 is foreign function interface, so this is how you'd call Java methods. So this is if you want, uh, so here you declare, uh, you, you create a Haskell data type that corresponds to a Java type. So here you declare, okay, this, uh, this Haskell collection type corresponds to java.util.collection and so on. So now these are, these are functions to import certain methods. For example, if you want to uh, import the add method and the get method and so on. So I'm sorry for being quick, but I don't have time. So this is a, this is a simple example. So what it does is uh, I've created a monadic interface to inter interact with uh, Java functions using a thing called a Java monad. So in the Java monad, the first argument will be, uh, so in Java you have a concept of this, right? So the object you're talking about now. So I've managed to find a way to uh, embed that same concept inside of Haskell using monads. So uh, you don't have to, in this case you don't, so you can actually call functions on an object without actually using this, yeah, without actually mentioning the object itself, because that's threaded through the monad. So you can generally, th you can think of the Java monad as a state monad, but it's a very special monad that's recognized by the compiler that'll do the optimizations to make it at least somewhat efficient. So what this does is, it, all it does is just, uh, it takes a lazy list, it converts that to an array list in Java, and then uh, reads from that array list and prints stuff out. It's just to show you can create an array, array list from GHCVM and then come back. So let me run this real quick. So as you see, so it's printed out exactly what it's supposed to. So what the program did was, it, create, it, called pop, uh, so it called populate array 10. So what it'll do is it'll create a, an array list that contains the element uh, numbers from zero to, to 10, and then it'll print out the values in the array list. It'll read from the array list and then print it back, all within Haskell. So the key part here is you're not, you're not ever actually calling Java. Actually, the only part you call Java is when you want to read from the array list. Obviously, you can't do that in Haskell exactly. But the point is, you never had to write a line of ha uh, Java code. All of this is within Haskell only, and it's in a nice typed monadic inter interface. So if you see, uh, what I did was, here, uh, I called, uh, so what I did was I created uh, the integer, integer objects, wrapping the Haskell integers, and then I multiplied them by, by five. So when you multiply the numbers from zero to ten, 10 by five, you'll get a result like this, zero, five, ten, so on. So yeah, so uh, I could, if anybody's interested in contributing to this, making this uh, evolve, like we need help putting package libraries, we need help writing peer, inter uh, peer wrappers around important Java libraries like JDBC. JDBC is a biggie that uh, is used a lot. And then we also need uh, a Java FI generator. So you saw the FFI I was just showing. Uh, so it, it looks pretty complicated, right? So. So it looks pretty compl complicated, right? Like, and a lot of this can be machine derived, meaning a, uh, a program can just read a class file, Java class file, and figure out how to generate these signatures. So it's, it shouldn't be something you have to uh, write yourself, right? So, uh, so it would be cool to have uh, some program that, that, that can just take a list of all the methods you want to import, and I'll make it generate the signatures for you. And then ID support. So the work is being done on this, but it's been delayed. Like. Uh, there's a plugin called Haskforce that it's a it's a plugin for IntelliJ that works with Haskell, so uh, I'm working with the maintainer of that to get this working for GCVM as well. So you have a nice IDE to work with. So that's it, and uh, you can contact me in any of these through any of these. Yep. There are a lot of. For industrial usage, a lot of stuff is missing from regular plain old GNC. Right. And you're trying to fill in the gaps. Do you have like a quick 
Or can you share a quick list right now? What do you feel are those gaps? So I actually don't. Like uh, I've, most of my work has so far has been just trying to get this thing, thing to work properly. That's the that's what I have to work on the next month or so. Just figuring out what, what where all the gaps are. I think you're serving on the correct. So you've already started something about this about how to standardize the web uh, web application development in Haskell. So I want to do something similar to that for, for like all the major things like. Uh, being able to create data pipelines, data pipelines involving Hadoop and Spark without actually touching Hadoop and Spark within Haskell. So there's many ideas I have, but right now it's not complete planned out yet. Yeah. Gaps, I sort of agree to that. I've, I've been focusing on the web app side of the gaps, right? right. I'm sure there are gaps in other things as well. But why try to fill in those gaps after porting GHC to Java? Of moving everything to the JVM. So one in the JVM, you, like you have like a, a ton of libraries are already available are already available for, for you. So once the Java inter, inter, uh, Java FFI is in place, it'll be easier to it'll speed up the process essentially. Like in GHC, the best case you have is you have to write C functions, which not everybody these days is comfortable with doing. But everybody these days can easily write Java functions, right? Java is taught everywhere. People are familiar with writing Java. Java function, so it'll be much easier in that aspect. Yeah, that's the point. But eventually, you need to do side effects, right? And uh, you need to call, if you look, even if you, so you said you, you shouldn't have to like write another language, right? If you look at the core libraries of ha like GHC Haskell, it's all like really, really low level stuff. Like I've been porting it, so I, I know it. It's very, very little stuff, like copying memory from one place to another. Very little stuff is happening, and they call C functions for that. So I want to make that easier instead of C, Java. You can do that same little stuff in Java now. Uh, when I was... Yeah, there is. <laughs> right. So I haven't thought through completely, but I uh, have given a basic thought. So the main, main thing is, as long as like you, the changes you make to that function that you're reloading, don't actually, like, the types are just a way to protect yourself from shooting yourself in the foot at compile time. So when you get to the runtime phase, the types don't exist anymore. They're not there. All you have are uh, the SDG closure I told you. You just have those, that's it. So you don't have any notion of types there. So as long as, like, uh, so yeah, that's something we have to think about. But I, I would think as long as the type is hasn't changed when you change the function uh, upon reloading, as long as it's the same, I'm pretty sure as long as you change just the implementation, I don't think it'll make a huge difference. Again, that's just what I think. It might not be true. So I have to investigate that further. Yeah. Thank you.